And we are now broadcasting. All right, hello everybody. It uh, looks like we've got some people joining us here. Excellent, excellent. We got lots of people. Hopefully, uh, you know we're gonna we're gonna wait a little bit, but we've got uh, people coming in early. That's good. Welcome to our webinar. While we're waiting, I'm gonna ask you guys a couple of questions. If you want to open up your little chat window at the bottom. <clears throat> I'm just curious, uh, you know, uh, what? Where is everybody from? If you wanna, if you wanna type in your city, that would be great. Really curious to see where everybody's from. Excellent. We got uh, we got some Calgary. We got some some people from Lethbridge. It's like Swan River, Spruce Grove. Excellent. Brandon. Good to see you, Kelowna, excellent. St. John's, Newfoundland, wonderful. Good to see you guys, thank you for joining. Excellent. Wonderful, yeah, we got people from all over the place. Good, good to see everyone joining here today. Um, we're going to we're going to get started at uh, exactly 1205. We're just going to give everyone time to to get into the webinar and and get situated with their technology, make sure everything's working. Uh, you know, while we're waiting, a uh, you know, quick question. Uh, you know, obviously, this is you know over lunchtime uh, for some of us. Uh, for some of us, it's just before lunch, and for some of us, obviously, it's after lunch. But I'm just curious, what, what's everyone eating for for lunch today? If you want to type that in the chat, that'd be great. What, what are you having for lunch? Excellent, looks like we got some soup, we got some chili. <clears throat> All kinds of fun, fun stuff. Some noodles. <laughs> bologna, the good old bologna sandwich, love that. That's a, that's a, that's a, favorite, a favorite childhood staple. Excellent, good to see everybody out there. We've got more, more people coming in. Wonderful. So while we're, while we're waiting for people, I got another, another couple of questions for you. Um, what, uh, what are you hoping to get out of this event? If you wanna type in there, that'd be great. What, what are you hoping to get out of this event today? You want to type that in chat? That would be awesome. Again, what are you what are you hoping to get out of this event today? You want to type that in the chat window? Looks like we're we're a little over halfway, I think, uh, as far as registrations are concerned. So that's great. We'll give everyone another few more minutes to to jump on board, and then we will get started. Hopefully everybody is doing well out there. Obviously in this uh, current situation, uh, you know, I imagine most of us are at home uh, right now. And so uh, hopefully you have a nice comfortable uh, spot to work and uh, join us today. One of the things I'm, I'm curious about, I'm actually gonna put up a poll question if you guys wanna, wanna answer that. <clears throat> we'll pop it up on your screen. But I'm just curious, curious, you know, with 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 COVID-19 and and uh, you know everything that's been going on, the new pandemic, uh, you know, I'm wondering you know, how will COVID-19 change, um, you know, how we work going forward. So I'm going to throw that poll up on your screen. If you want to answer that, you know, do you think more people will work from home? Uh, do you think uh, things will go back to the way they were? Are you not sure? Uh, just curious, what you guys all think? What how how do you think this is going to affect us? going forward. 
And for more, for those of you that are just joining us, we just threw up a quick poll here while we're waiting for everyone to start. Excellent. It's like we've got 61% of the people have voted already. Wonderful. Give it another couple seconds. Looks like uh, looks like most people are are thinking yes that that uh, more people will work from home, but we'll just give everyone another second. Excellent. All right. Well, I'm going to end the polling here now and share the results with you guys. So it looks like 76% of us do think that more people are going to work from home if they can. So interesting, cool, cool to note. All right. While well, we're still waiting waiting for more people to join us. Um, I'm curious, uh, I'm gonna ask you another poll question here. Um, how, many, how many of you uh, will work more from home when this is over? How many of you will work more from home when this is over? How many of you will work more from home when this is over? Just curious what the feedback is here. Again, we're just taking some fun polls while we're waiting for everyone to get here. We're gonna start at 12, 12.05. So if you're just joining us, we're, we're gonna start at 12.05 today. Just curious how many of you will, will work from home when this is over. <clears throat> Excellent, all right, I'm gonna end the polling here and I'm gonna share the results with you guys. So it looks like the majority of folks uh, are thinking no, uh, they're not going to work from home uh, as much. But uh, you know, thirty percent looks like uh, they are going to try to work from home. So that's that's interesting to note. All right, we'll stop that, <clears throat> and we've got just a few more minutes to go here while we're waiting. Give everyone some time to settle in. And you know, I'm gonna ask you one more quick question before we get started. One more quick polling question, if you guys wouldn't mind answering it. What is the best time for you to participate in a webinar? Just curious about that. What is the best time for you to participate in the morning, uh, lunchtime, afternoon, evening? What's, what's the best time for you to participate in a webinar? Looks like, looks like lunch is leading the pack, so. That's a, that's a good thing. Give you a couple more seconds to vote. Almost all the votes are in. Excellent, excellent. Good stuff. All right, we're going to close the polling and I will share the results with you. So it looks like, looks like lunchtime is, is a winner. So we chose well. <laughs> Uh, but I'm very interested to see morning as well as, as the as the runner up. So that's that's good. Uh, you know, obviously, depending on time zones, we service uh, all of Western Canada. So, uh, you know, we want to make sure that, uh, uh, you know, we're, we're spreading the love across uh, the time zones. So, uh, yeah, we'll take that in consideration for our next one and, uh, you know, make sure that that uh, everyone is uh, is able to join. All right, guys, it's 1205. We are going to get started. Uh, if anyone else is joining us later, that's, uh, that's on them. They should have been on time. All right. <laughs> so, <clears throat> um, you know, my name is Steve Kress. I am the marketing manager for Gateway Mechanical Services. I'm going to be your host for today's webinar, and I'm very excited to see all of you here today. Uh, looks like we've got uh, roughly about 60 plus people joining us today. So that is very exciting. Uh, we've got a very diverse uh, um, group of people with us today. We have uh, all kinds of industries being represented from, let's say, from grocery stores all the way to construction, uh, education, property management, condos, retail, assisted living. Yeah, we got, we, got a, we got a really diverse group with us today, so that is very exciting. Um, just to make sure that we are all in the right place, uh, welcome to our webinar on air purification and your HVAC system. How to manage airborne pathogens and deliver clean air to your facility. If you're looking for how to dance the merengue with Steve, you're definitely in the wrong webinar. <laughs> I believe that one is scheduled for 6 p.m. later today. So if you're interested, just uh, message us in the chat window. <laughs> 
So before we get started, we have a few housekeeping items we want to take care of. Uh, I just want to remind everyone that we are recording this event. Uh, depending on how it turns out, we're hoping to share it with you. Um, you may have noticed on your screen that there are two icon icons located in the uh, bottom uh, middle. Um, <clears throat> you may uh, note that these are the chat icon and the Q&A. Uh, the chat function, uh, which we started using here at the beginning, we're probably not going to be used too much more today, uh, but it does allow you to communicate with me and my support team. Uh, the QA window, on the other hand, is what we are going to be using going forward. It's the primary function is to capture your questions. So as we're going through the presentations, if you have a particular question that comes to mind, just ask it in the Q&A and we'll make sure we address it during the Q&A section after the presentations are done. Uh, polling, uh, you guys all have some experience, so we will probably ask you a few more polling questions throughout the presentation. So please uh, answer those polls and we'll share the results with you. Uh, and finally, uh, there will be a short survey after uh, the webinar and we'd really appreciate your feedback. Uh, the more feedback we have, the, the better uh, content we can produce for you going forward. So all of that being said, let's get started. <clears throat> so today we're going to talk about the impact poor indoor air quality can have on you and the people using your facilities. We're going to talk about your building environment and the internal and external elements that influence your air quality. We're going to talk about filtration and how that impacts your air quality. We're going to discuss your ducts and you know, the arteries of your HVAC system. And we're going to do all of this in the first 15 minutes of this webinar. After that, we're going to take a deep dive into UV with our industry partner, Sanubox. We're going to learn about UV and how it can help us manage airborne pathogens and clean your building's air. And then finally, we're going to try and save 15 or more minutes uh, for the Q&A with our panel so we can answer all of your questions. So do remember uh, as, as you go along to throw those uh, questions into the Q&A and we will make sure that we address those. So without further ado, I'd like to take a minute to introduce our speakers and panelists for the day. Uh, Joanne Olvey is the VP of Sales for Sandybox in Western Canada. She's a mechanical engineering technologist and has been working in the HVAC industry for over 20 years. Uh, Joanne, please turn your camera on and say hi to everyone. Hi everyone uh, from snowy Calgary. It's still winter here, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the webinar, Joanne. Uh, and last but not least, we have our very own Dwayne Anderson. Hello Dwayne, everyone. Welcome. <laughs> Dwayne is the Senior Business Development Manager for Gateway. He has over 30 years experience in the HVAC industry, including operating a high-rise building, uh, sales of an HVAC manufacturer and president of a Canada-wide HVAC network. Dwayne, say hi. Hello. <laughs> Welcome, Dwayne. We're very excited to have both of you here today. So, Dwayne, I'm going to kick things over to you to get things started. Uh, so, if you want to take over my screen, that would be great. Fantastic. Thank you, Steve. Uh, you're welcome. All right. So, let's start off with another poll question. How much time does the average person spend indoors? Steve, can you throw that up there? I'm working on it. There we go. So how much time does the average person spend indoors? All right, give a couple more seconds to vote. Okay. All right, I'm gonna end the polling here now. And what are results? And here are the results. Oh, yeah, especially lately. <laughs> 90% of the time. Great, thank you. So coronavirus, it has radically changed our lives and the world as we know it. This pandemic has made us all more aware of germs and viruses and is the stimulus of our webinar today, air purification and your HVAC systems. Viruses are one of many contaminants that can be found in an HVAC system. And Sanyu Voss will discuss this in more detail later. But as we see illustrated here, there are other contaminants in the air. From outside, things like pollen, dust, mold. Then there's things that we bring in, 
uh, perfume, body odor, and there's other things illustrated. How do they affect us? Well, let's consider some facts. Um, chances are all of us have a home. Some of it might be in a strata, some of it might be in a condo. But prior to quarantine, how much time did we spend in an office? Well, we all answered the poll question correctly. Canadians spend 90% of their time indoors. And do you remember when, back in the old days, you know, historians refer to it as BC or before COVID? Back in those days, mom used to tell us to go play outside. Well, why? Well, it was to get some fresh air. And maybe mom was onto something because there's two to five times more pollution indoors than there is outdoors. And what does this cause? Well, as we can see by the statistics, there's 50% of illness caused by indoor pollution. And what if you have asthma or suffer from allergic rhinitis? And then of course, there's the financial impact of people not working due to illness. So we can, we can safely say that air purification affects where we live, it affects our employers, it affects our income, our health, and even our lives. Air purification affects so much of what we do. And if we spend 90% of our time in, uh, inside, we need to have purified air in our HVAC systems. But the first thing we need to consider before we even get to an HVAC system is the environment around a facility. And when a service plan or a maintenance agreement is being put together by Gateway Mechanical, it is imperative that we understand the environment that's outside the facility. Through observations and conversations with our customers, we need to become familiar with what is occurring around your building so we can personalize and customize a service plan for you. So what things do we consider? Well, dust and dirt is one of the obvious things. And if we think about um, things such as the winter months that have just gone by and how they put uh, sand and gravel on the roads so we have traction, well, when spring eventually comes, that is still on the roads. And vehicles disturb, the, disturb that and then an excessive amount of dust and dirt becomes airborne. We've seen cities grow too. In, in Alberta, the two major cities now have ring roads growing around them. There's been a lot of construction and uh, higher traffic volumes. Just to give an example of when I lived in Edmonton on the north side, in the Albany area was a Walmart nine years ago. It was the only thing in the area. Nine years has passed. Albany has a shopping center right across 127th Street next door. There's a Newcastle shopping center. Houses and condominiums all have gone up in that area. The ring road has been completed. So what used to be a standalone building now has all this other activity taking place, which increases the amount of dust and dirt that's in the air in, the, in that area. Then there's what I call uh, natural items, allergens, things such as uh, pollen, poplar fluff, or even because of the growth of the cities, there are a lot of buildings that are being constructed and near agricultural land. So a farmer's field during harvest time also creates a lot of uh, items that come in the air. Uh, for example, I recall a facility in Fort Saskatchewan that has, uh, that's a laboratory and next to it, it has poplar trees and a farmer's field. And that is the air, that is stuff that comes in the air and towards the HVAC systems that you need to be aware of. Then of course, there are uh, refineries and factories that contribute to uh, air pollution, as well as car emissions. For, uh, for example, in loading docks, vehicles can pull into a loading dock. They may run for a while, and some loading docks have fresh air intake right beside that. I've seen facilities where the parking lot is next to the fresh air intake. And you can imagine the long winters, people don't wanna get into cold vehicles. So they remote start their vehicle, the vehicle runs, and now all of those emissions are coming in through the fresh air intake. Then in BC, we have our annual fire season out here. So we need to be cognizant and aware that this has a potential of occurring. 
and we need to do what we can to prevent the particulates from that in entering facilities. So these are things that exist outside a facility that a quality service contractor needs to identify, communicate, and propose a solution to. And that's just outside of the building. Let's move inside. Again, when Gateway Mechanical prepares a service plan or a maintenance agreement, it is imperative that we understand the environment that's inside the facility as well, as each environment is different. Uh, for example, just illustrated here, we have shopping centers, senior, seniors housing complexes, uh, food processing, laboratories, electronic manufacturers, and operating rooms. All of these things will require different uh, filtration for purified air. Steve, let's read another poll question. When was the last time you changed your filter at home? We're spending more time at home now, but when was the last time we changed the filter when our home? Now, just a public service announcement, Gateway Mechanical does not do residential work in homes, but just to make you aware, and you can apply this information to your own home. What other else results, Steve? Oh, a month ago, that's really good. <laughs> yeah, some of those results are aren't surprising. But considering, you know, we as Canadians spend 90% of our time indoors and the indoor air pollution is two to five times more than outside, it is something that we, we need to be aware of. As illustrated here, we spend a lot of time in these environments, whether it's at home or at work. So from what's illustrated here, what do you recognize? Do you recognize yourself in any of these symptoms or any of uh, perhaps your coworkers in the past? What do you, uh, what do you think some of them are? You know, maybe uh, there's obviously coughing there, sore throat, itchy eyes, headaches, you know, fatigue. All of these are uh, a result of poor indoor air quality. So these things, what effect does it have? Well, we're gonna discuss two and a half things that it affects. The first thing it affects is productivity. So our employers, they expect employees to be productive. And if you're a property manager and operations manager, your tenants, our, you know, our business owners, they expect the same of their employees to be productive. And yet there is half a million workers go home each week due to health issues. There's a staggering amount of money lost due to labor illness and our healthcare system spends a lot of money on healthcare. In fact, even things like Blue Cross and corporate health plans spend up to $68 billion a year. And if we consider that all ties into uh, that 50% Ill, that of illnesses are caused by indoor air quality, there is a, a cost, uh, a loss of productivity, a human cost with uh, failed air purification. The second is this, the cost of operating equipment. Um, in my nearly 25 years in service sales, in the industry, you hear the cookie cutter approach of just change my filter four times per year. Well, just think about that for a moment. What if that isn't enough based on the environment or what you do? What if it's the wrong type of filter for your HVAC system? The US Department of Energy did a study and it said that by, uh, um, by being proactive and having scheduled filter changes with the right filters, there can be a, a reduction of energy costs of five to 15%. And why is that? Well, when a filter gets full, the unit now has to run harder to pull air across the filter and across the coil. So energy costs go up. And this takes us to point 2.5, which is the cost of ownership of that equipment. When the filter is full and not changed, it now starts to offload onto the evaporator coil. The evaporator coil now gets plugged. And again, the internal components of that HVAC unit needs to work harder to pull air across the filter and the coil, which leads to 
um, <clears throat> repairs shortened and shortened equipment life. So you may be replacing not just components, but the entire unit itself before it's reached its life expectancy. So there's the cost of ownership. So what we've uncovered here today is that every environment, whether external or internal, is different for each facility. At Gateway Mechanical, uh, we desire for you to have good quality air in your facility through your HVAC systems. So we want to match the right filter to the right environment. And, uh, and then changing the frequency uh, accordingly that meets, that, um, that meets those requirements. Really personalizing and customizing a service program for you. Uh, let's run another poll question here, Steve. Yeah, sounds great. What are, 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 are you familiar with MERV ratings? Is everyone familiar with those? Looks like we're almost near the end. We got 70%. All right. Let's see if we can get to 100%. Come on, come on. <laughs> <laughs> all right, looks like 76 is all we're going to get. Okay. By the results. By the results. Okay, so there are 60% uh, are familiar with MERV rating. So what a MERV rating is, it is the minimum efficiency reporting value of a filter. So a rating scale, a rating scale goes from 1 to 16. So a MERV-1 filter is really great at catching pigeons and softballs. And the higher up of the number you go, like a 13 to a 16, it catches smaller particulates, which is you know, illustrated here uh, on this graph. So if you're familiar with BOMA, the Building Owners and Managers Association, and you're trying, your facility is trying to get BOMA best status, there are certain requirements of filtration you need to use and they specify what MERV rating uh, that you need in those facilities. So again, depending on what you do in that facility, we'll, we will um, recognize what type of MERV rating that a filter that you need. And we have to keep in mind too that um, a higher MERV rating filter may also affect how the equipment operates. It needs to be compatible because a higher rated MERV filter would do the same as a, as a plug filter. It, you need to not have enough air uh, come through the system. So we're mindful of that when we prepare a service plan for you. So we've discussed air purification in your HVAC system. We've addressed why and how you can proact proactively remove particles from that system, but doing so at the HVAC equipment. So now we may say that we have all of our ducts in a row, but now we need to consider past the equipment the ductwork. So let me ask you, out of the two pictures here, which air would you prefer to breathe? The one on the left or the one on the right? Well, I'm sure we're talking air purification. We, we would like to breathe air that comes with the ductwork on the right. So ducts need to be cleaned as well. But think of it this way, your HVAC equipment, whether it be an air handler or a rooftop unit, that is the heart of your HVAC system. The ductwork is like the arteries. But if they're clogged, it's not a healthy situation. Well, it's the same true. You can, do, you can filter out all the air, but if your ducts are dirty, it's, it's still going to create an impure environment in the office space. And we've seen what that leads to with health uh, with individuals. So it really defeats everything we've discussed now if our ducts are dirty. So just a few key takeaways from what we've discussed here uh, uh, this afternoon is uh, we need to recognize the contaminants that are external to the environment of a facility, understand the objective of what is taking place internally in that facility, matching the filtration to the needs, creating a planned schedule for changing those filters because we want to reduce productivity loss and enhance the cost of owning and operating HVAC equipment. And ultimately, too, you want to have your ducts clean. Now, Gateway Mechanical can propose a service plan or a maintenance program that is customized specifically for you because with Gateway, it's personal. But wait, there's more. Steve, <laughs> you have another poll question for us? I do, I do. 
So how much do you know about UVC? Excellent. Looks like it's, the results are coming in fast. Fantastic. We're, we're at 60%. Let's see if we can get, we beat our last poll. Oh, come on, the last poll. We got 70. We got to do better than that. We, we can get there. We can get there. Oh, hey, there we go. We're over 80%. Fantastic. Excellent. Well, well, how much do we know about UVC? Well, let's, let's share the results. Great. Well, fantastic. So that's why you're all here. <laughs> yeah, it looks like it looks like fifty three percent and not much is good, and and you know that's why we've got Sandy Box here with us today. Exactly. So this is where I uh, would like to introduce Joanne Ogilvy, Vice President of Sales, of Western Canada, for uh, Sandy Box Technologies. Please uh, welcome Joanne. Thank you. Just give me a moment here. Sorry. Sorry. So, okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, great to have everybody uh, inquiring on indoor air quality, given the COVID-19 um, situation and such. Uh, I know I've been very busy the last few weeks. <laughs> so uh, to start off with, I, I just wanted to um, explain a few things. Uh, well, first of all, I would like to say Sanya Box has been around for 25 years. We are Canadian owned and our manufacturing is uh, just outside of Montreal in Quebec. We have a full residential line along with uh, commercial uh, products that are sized for commercial applications and, and also with uh, medical. Uh, we've been doing a lot of work with different hospitals, and um, surface sterilization, etc. Now um, we have a, a great website that has some really good resources on it, um, and I just wanted to just start with uh, just a very basic explanation of what uh, what UV spectrums are and uh, and how Sanibox utilizes them. So with uh, with our spectrum chart here. Uh, we have all of our UV uh, spectrums listed out here on this left side. And to start with, UV A and B are naturally here on the Earth's surface. Uh, they do hold some germicidal qualities, but it, it's, they're not very powerful. UV A, B, C, and V are all invisible. We cannot see the UV spectrums. UV A is typically uh, uh, the weakest of them. Uh, it would be what a CSI would use for a black light. UVB is a bit stronger and that is when you would get a suntan. Now the two spectrums that Manubox uses is UVC and UVV. Now these are naturally in the in the Earth's atmosphere. If they were here on the Earth's surface we would look like the moon. They are that powerful. So we essentially are bringing a little sunshine indoors uh, to do the germicidal uh, treatment, along with a little bit of oxidation odor removal. With UVC, we sit at a 254 nanometer uh, dosage. And, and what this is, is a what we call germicidal treatment. We break the DNA of bacteria and spores and RNA of viruses. And this, uh, what this does is the uh, contaminant can no longer reproduce and it dies shortly thereafter. So we eliminate uh, any of these contaminants from reproducing in, in, this, in the system. What UVV is, uh, which is 185 nanometers, uh, is a molecule change. It is a vacuum uh, UV spectrum. And basically what happens is the hydrogen and oxygen molecules separate. They become hydroxyl radicals. And that's where we acquire the odor removal uh, functionality of our systems. Now we do, we do uh, supply 100% uh, germicidal only. And this would be for like, say, a, a lab um, uh, or even 
a cannabis grow facility, um, et cetera, uh, where there is no requirement for any odor removal. With the combination of the two, uh, we, can, we can look after things like animal shelters where there's a lot of odors involved. We can look after as well as germicidal and we can also do um, garbage rooms. Uh, we do garbage rooms very well, uh, very effectively uh, in, with our systems. Now, just to give you just a, a little preview here, this, uh, this just has one of our residential units, but when we put in an induct system to disinfect the air, uh, all of our lamps are positioned parallel with the airflow so that we get a a really nice long swipe dosage. Um, this is important. There's a lot of UV companies out there that have uh, stick lamps that, that they put in horizontally across and all you're getting is, is really the, the diameter of the lamp for a swipe, a dosage. Uh, with all of our commercial and residential induct systems, the, uh, the lamps are positioned parallel with the airflow. Now, one of the, the things that I wanted to also point out here is that we, we have a lot of different applications and we could, uh, I could talk about it for an hour or so, but uh, we, we, can, we can look after, uh, obviously, the in-building HVAC um, units and such for just office buildings, et cetera with assisted care facilities. Obviously the, 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 uh, the viruses would be a huge um, uh, sizing um, data with uh, garbage rooms and such. We, we would look at the uh, size of the room and, and select the appropriate equipment to do the job and such. We do uh, do a lot of work with hospitals as in surface sterilization um, to to sterilize the room when it's empty. You, you don't ever want to look at the, the lamp when, uh, when it's lit. You will get welder splash immediately. So it's very important that uh, the safeguard of installation and, um, and such is taken about. We did see some photos of uh, some pictures with wildfire smoke. Um, our units uh, will, will work very well for removing the uh the a lot of people will get like a, a you know a, a itchy throat or watery eyes etc and and with the sandy box unit being in the building it uh, eliminates that from from occurring the uh particles of the smoke obviously would be caught in a filter um the actual smoke is broken down with the uv UVC, the germicidal uh, spectrum that I, I was speaking of, uh, that's been used in water treatment for over a hundred years and, and widely accepted. Uh, ASHRAE has, uh, uh, has had a chapter on UV for uh, since about 2008 and uh, many of you probably are familiar with that chapter and such. They have a, a great uh, a, a very good uh, chart on reflective qualities uh, of UV uh, with working with different materials. So when we look at duct work, uh, we, we always recommend to use aluminum because it's highly reflective and it, it enhances the UV treatment, um, the dosage. If we're looking at galvanized steel, it, it's very low reflective qualities. It's only about 25% reflective. So that will affect sizing of, of induct and, and or um, the dosage treatment. Now with uh, treating the, uh, the, the air quality and stuff, if you get a moment to go onto our website, we actually have a, a very cool little visual that uh, it's actually in our grow saver section and stuff, but uh, it's at, at your own leisure. If you wanna have a look, this is a really great visual that will uh, show you how our units destroy uh, viruses, bacteria, and spores. And, and this is a great little, uh, little video visual uh, for that.
Now with the um, area that I'm here on the, on the blog section uh, under news, uh, we have some information and I, I just want to just touch on, on the PCO technology. Uh, a lot of uh, a lot of other UV companies uh, have they will incorporate titanium dioxide, uh, an actual piece uh, with UVC, and and what they're doing is uh, they're the reaction will cause hydroxyl radicals to be uh, be created, but the problem with the PCO technology is that the titanium dioxide wears out very quickly, but uh, all of them create formaldehyde. That is a byproduct of that reaction happening. So I, I do invite you to have a look. This is a, a, a scientific paper uh, written here uh, about that. Now, the, the other areas that we have in here, um, we also do what we call surface sterilization. So what that is, is coil cleaning. And so when we have uh, coils such as what's uh, pictured here, uh, it doesn't matter if it's a, a, a A or N coil in your home or if it's a great big wall of coils in the commercial buildings or even in a walk-in cooler, the very same thing happens. And what that is, is bacteria collects on the fins of the coils and that bacteria actually forms a bacterial biofilm that seals each fin individually. And what it does is it compromises your heat transfer. So your equipment's working harder to meet the set point. But it's also very sticky like glue, like you can't wipe it off. So technicians come in and they will uh, wash out the coils to use chem chemicals to, uh, uh, coil cleaning chemicals. Sometimes to organize that scheduling is a very big event and they may even have to remove the equipment out of the, say, walk-in cooler and stuff. Now, what the UV does is it will completely destroy the bacterial biofilm. So one of the very first advantages is that your fins are clean and your equipment is working more efficiently. The second advantage is that it is, um, uh, drastically reduces you having to schedule coil cleaning to happen because the, the UV is going to keep the coils clean. And the, the very last uh, advantage is that it's a great um, way to prevent formicary corrosion from ever developing. And so what happens with formicary corrosion is uh, the water starts pooling on the fins and it turns acidic and starts pitting the copper tubes. And then you have an equipment failure. Uh, so when you have clean fins, you don't even have this even starting to, uh, to happen, uh, to cr even creating, start to create. Uh, we have also um, an area in our news section that uh, has case studies of, of real customers of Sanubox. Uh, and when you have a moment, you can have a look at some of these. Um, as I was saying with the coil cleaning, um, there's a, a case study here, and this is a toilet paper manufacturing facility. And so uh, with that bacterial biofilm on, on, the, on the coils, their, their big wall of coils, would, they, they would plug solid from the fibers of the toilet paper that they were manufacturing. And they didn't believe us that it was a bacterial biofilm issue. And so when they, we were allowed to do the first couple uh, coils and, and immediately uh, they could see the benefit of the coil staying clean. So where the UV was, clean as a whistle, where it wasn't, was plugged solid. And we did do the whole facility. Now with coils as well, uh, when we're talking about uh, uh, walking coolers or um, uh, food banks, etc. Uh, a lot of uh, fruits and vegetables uh, and even fresh cut flowers, uh, they degrade uh, with ethylene levels. And so if, if we are sizing out a walk-in cooler, uh, I will often uh, size in a small portion of UVV oxidation uh, to keep the ethylene levels down and it will dramatically uh, increase the shelf life of any of the fruits, vegetables, cut flowers. 
Uh, we have uh, done several in Western Canada that I, I'm aware of, and of course, uh, well, uh, all across North America. Um, now, with uh, these case studies, you can have a look. Uh, this particular Hutterite colony is uh, just southeast of Lethbridge, and they had mold in their cooler, and they had done a lot of extensive manual labor to 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 clean those coolers on a on a weekly basis. It was it was uh, uh, it was a lot of work, and so they installed uh, the. IL series is our coil cleaner. They installed the ILs uh, in early July 2017 and they have had no reoccurrence of mold whatsoever. They're very, very pleased with it. But one of the things that they realized is uh, in, uh, they put it in in July and then in September they had bought two crates of pears and they didn't really do this on purpose, but they put one crate in the cooler on, with UV and one crate in the cooler without UV. So the crate that was in the cooler without UV had started to turn brown and rot within five days. And the, the, the pears that were in the cooler with the UV were like the day they put them in there. It was so very obvious of the, the shelf life difference. Um, so any facilities that have uh, cafeterias or, or even restaurants and such, uh, they all have walk-in coolers. This, this is a, a, a huge benefit, not only for uh, keeping the coils clean, but, but lengthening the shelf life of the produce. Um, now that particular colony has actually equipped all of their coolers along with their cold storage uh, with the uh, IL coil cleaning units. I, I would like to point out, uh, this is a, a hospital in, um, uh, in Houston, and they had this similar uh, to the pictures we've seen earlier of, 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 of really dirty uh, ducting and such. And um, we were able to uh, have a lot of different uh, benefits come out of this after the UV installation. So, when we, whenever we were sizing for contaminants, um, the, the coil cleaning uh, is, uh, we always size it for Aspergillus niger. If we kill black mold, we will kill everything else. And so that is one of the things of, of sizing that we take into account. Um, and as you can see on this case study here, we have an increase in the, uh, the efficiency of the equipment. And we also have the uh, um, an increase in the HEPA filters lifespan. Just a side note on, on filters versus UV. UV kills and destroys filters capture and catch. So uh, it's great to have the combination uh, to uh, increase your indoor air quality of using both. <clears throat> this is just a uh, a petri dish sample you can easily do that at your facility uh, you can take a petri dish and just just touch to the coils and within a few days you, you will see growth of bacterias and and such that will uh, be a real eye-opener as to you know how dirty are the coils uh, really and such so uh, we offer a a, a bio wall uh, that comes in different sizes. It's all sized to the site. Uh, it starts at 18 inch, 24, 30, 40, 50, and 60 inch. Uh, it's all very dependent on the, the, uh, the duct dimension, uh, as well as the CFM. And these are all factors that we take into account for sizing, because we need to make sure that we, uh, our, our torpedo is long enough to be able to zap that contaminant as it passes. The other important part about it is that we need to know how, how, much, how many air changes per hour uh, when we're sizing for uh, contaminants such as spores, etc. When we're sizing for viruses, uh, we size it for the one pass to get it. Uh, that we don't want to rely on recirculation uh, because we don't want any live viruses uh, going past uh, our equipment uh, to reproduce. With the coil cleaning, they are also offered in many different sizes, uh, starting from 12 inch all the way to uh, 60 inch. 
and it's very dependent on the on the coil width and the height. And they all our all of our equipment comes with a um, multiple volt ballast, so it can be hooked up to anywhere from 120 volt to um, to 277, and it's single stage. Now, with also with our our units, uh, we also have um, uh, other commercial standalone units. If we have a situation where we don't have duct work to work with, uh, say there is a, a smoking room. I've, I've come across quite a few schools that, uh, in, uh, that have smudging rooms where indigenous students uh, do smudging or smoking pipe and things like that. And so we have units that will actually uh, break down that smoke as well as uh, purify the air. And, and remove the odors and stuff. My computer is a bit slow here, I apologize. Um, I think I'll just back out of there because it's not doing it. Uh, we, uh, we can also deal with uh, VOCs, uh, as in locker rooms. Um, there's a lot of bacteria and a lot of people do different lockers and such, so just nasty things in there. Uh, we, if you think about a, a, a gymnasium where they have like showers and lockers and stuff and you get that musty odor from the high humidity and stuff, these are all things that we can very easily deal with. Uh, as I mentioned, we do garbage rooms very well. Uh, there's um, a condo downtown in Calgary just on, uh, along the river that the, the people, the it, very high-end condo that thinking that suites went for like over a million dollars each. Um, they had their garbage room, their garbage rooms underground parkade. The odors from the garbage room were affecting every, every level, every floor uh, because of the garbage chutes, but also it, the odors got into their, their elevator shaft. And so we equipped their garbage room uh, with our S300 for the size of the room and it was very immediate. Uh, the, uh, the, I had a meeting with a property management group in there a few months ago and we were in there for probably 40 minutes and you could not smell garbage at all and, uh, and there's no flies because there's nothing attracting the flies. So he was very impressed with that. Now we do do um, also with the air infection or disinfection, um, we, we do have um, uh, the standalone units for doing either 100% germicidal or odor removal and germicidal. So we do a kind of a combination there of that. Um, there is also on, on here a, a little, again, a little video that kind of shows how the air moves in, in the system. We build our buildings so tight uh, to be energy efficient that we trap a lot of the contaminants inside and they, they thrive and they multiply and that's where we get a lot of times a sick building syndrome where people's uh, flus and colds go around in a vicious circle where you get it and then two weeks later you got it again and such. So having a, a sandy box unit uh, in, your, in, in your HVAC system would definitely eliminate that and as uh, as was mentioned, uh, the, the amount of people that phone in sick or, or are not well because of poor indoor air quality is uh, quite substantial. Hey, Joanna, I'm going to have to uh, get you to wrap it up here. We're, oh. we're close to the end of our time. All right. I just want to very quickly show uh, we have a, uh, a sizing software and uh, that is a, a proprietary to Sanibox. And so I just want to just quickly show that when we are sizing our products, uh, as I mentioned, the CFM and the, the, the material being used, et cetera, is part of the, the equation. And I have a database uh, that's enormous of uh, different types of contaminants. So these particular contaminants is something that I would use for, say, an assisted living facility. I'm going to size it for coronavirus, influenza A, uh, measles, possibly Legionella. Um, and, and in that, uh, we would have a summary as to uh, how many passes it takes to destroy. Um, so um, yes, thank you very much for your time. 
and um, I will uh, try to figure out how to stop this here. <laughs> I'll take control here. Okay, thanks. <laughs> well, thank you very much, uh, Joanne. That was that was excellent information. Um, <clears throat> Dwayne, I assume you're still there as well. I'll get you both to turn your microphones on. Um, we're going to move into the uh, Q&A portion. Uh, we have some great questions here uh, to start with. And uh, as you probably guessed, a lot of them uh, have to do with, with, uh, with UV. Um, if anyone else has questions, uh, please add them to the Q&A uh, tool uh, on your screen so then we can get around to answering them. But I'm going to start off here at the top of the list. So uh, one of the questions I have uh, for you, Joanne, is, you know, is there any uh, scientific or medical evidence that, that UV systems uh, kill the COVID-19 virus? Uh, so we did talk about other viruses. Uh, we're just curious about that, obviously, in, in the current uh, time and era that we're in. Okay, so we have the data for uh, the coronavirus SARS because uh, that's been around for quite a few years. Uh, COVID-19 is very, very similar in makeup um, and would be um, very, very close to the same dosage. It's actually uh, influenza A is, is harder to kill than the coronavirus. And measles, also another airborne virus, is harder to kill than coronavirus. Now, we have uh, just in the last couple weeks uh, with everything going on with COVID-19, um, uh, Dr. Brace has um, designed a, a facial mask disinfectant uh, cabinet where we are using UVC uh, to, uh, to destroy that virus on the face masks. Um, now, we do have a, a white paper on our website uh, with Barclays uh, uh, that is a medical study. And uh, I do invite anybody to have a look uh, at that. And it's in our it's in our medical uh, um, tab. It's also in the white papers area. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, another question uh, for you. Are, are there any health hazards or risks uh, generated with the introduction of a UV system? No, you, you cannot overdo germicidal treatment. Um, it, it won't harm you. Uh, it's in the duct work. You're not going to, you're not going to visibly see the, the, the lamps and uh, it will do a great job destroying the contaminants. Um, we do take a uh, particular caution when, when sizing with odor removal to ensure that we are sizing to remove the odors, but not to create ozone. Great, thank you. Well, that was going to be my next question was, was ozone specifically. I, we've been doing a lot of reading about UV and so we're just curious about uh, ozone. So obviously you just answered that question. Well, I would like to just add a little bit more. Uh, UVC cannot create ozone at all. It, uh, it is 100% it is germicidal only. It is UVV or the oxidation process that we can start having the oxygen molecules bond when they are com confined and we could start creating ozone with UVV. Now that takes me back to that PO technology where they, there, there is hydroxyl radicals and so it's possible that you know it could create ozone as well. What, uh, what, what's the uh, lifespan of a UV system? You know, are there recurring costs associated with operating the unit uh, other than, you know, obviously the electrical cost? That's a good question. Uh, uh, for the most part, they're fairly inexpensive units. And, uh, and the, the lifespan on a commercial uh, equipment is two years. Every two years, the lamps would be replaced. So it won't magically just stop igniting, it will still ignite, but the, the uh, dosage that, it, that it's uh, creating, it, it gets weaker and weaker over time. So when I size out these units, I actually size it for the end of life of the lamp. And so the uh, equipment will, will uh, alert uh, when it is time due, uh, in, due to runtime hours uh, to change those lamps. And, and then, of course, if there was a, a, a ballast issue or a lamp issue or lamp went out, then it would actually have an alarm to, uh, to notify the, the facility. 
you can tie them into building management systems. There's dry contacts on both the ILs and the, uh, and the bio walls. Great, thank you. So this one's a little bit more technical question, but do we need to you know, require any like interlocks or, or things like that in the, in the RTUs and the HUs? Um, I always uh, I always supply quote a, a kill switch for the access door. Uh, we don't want anybody to ever open up that uh, access door and visibly see the the lamps. So there is uh, there's always a kill switch that's put on so that we take that precaution. Right. Well, and that would you know we have another question here about just you know protecting against accidental UV exposure, you know eye damage that kind of thing. So. Um, I guess that would take care of that, yes? Correct, yes. And then on, on the food uh, applications, walking coolers and such, we, we do offer Teflon coated UV lamps so that if somebody was to bump it or, or uh, accidentally bang it, it won't break into a gazillion pieces because uh, the Teflon will hold it together, uh, and, which is important because you don't want to have uh, shards of, of uh, quartz everywhere. Right, and you know, one of the questions somebody had here, another technical question, is just about VOCs. Um, you know, how many different VOCs does does UV uh, protect against? Well, a lot. It all depends on whether or not that VOC can be oxidized. So, for example, formaldehyde can be oxidized. So, if you're talking like a morgue, we can absolutely deal with that. Um, now, uh, if you're talking about radon, uh, that uh, seeps from below would say somebody's house it cannot be oxidized so uv would not be very helpful in in that application so it's all dependent on that voc and whether or not it, it can be oxidized um, and whenever i get a question like that i i always uh i always i always converse with uh dr brace to uh to make sure that uh, we're you know having the correct information and such well, great. That, that brings us to the end of our Q&A. Uh, I want to thank, uh, you know, our guest speakers for showing up today. Thank you, Joanne. Thank you, Dwayne. Uh, it was really informative having you here today, and I'm sure everybody online really appreciated it. Um, so thank you again. Uh, we'll give you a virtual round of applause. <laughs> um, I also want to remind everybody uh, out there that, uh, you know, if you have any more questions about uh, about UV or air purification in general, maintenance questions, you know, please reach out to your uh, account manager. And if you don't have an account manager and you're just joining us new today, please uh, give us a shout at our 1-800 number, uh, visit us online or even email us at uh, sales at gateway mechanical.ca and we're more than happy to help you out and answer any questions that you might have. Uh, finally, your feedback is extremely important to us. Uh, you know, we want to continue to deliver great content, uh, you know, engaging content and informative content. Uh, so, you know, there will be a survey at the end of this uh, in your browser. It'll open up. If you wouldn't mind clicking on that link uh, just to complete that quick survey, it should only take you a couple of minutes. That feedback is, is very important to us. So this concludes our uh, webinar for today. I really want to thank everybody again for joining us. I hope you have a wonderful day. Uh, stay safe out there and, uh, you know, have, uh, you know, if it's sunny, uh, try to get outside, uh, even if it's just on your patio or your backyard, uh, just to get a little bit of, of, of uh, sun and vitamin C. Thanks a lot, everybody. Take care. Uh, and remember, with Gateway, it's personal. Thank you.